Welcome to the webinar, Tag in Action, Teen Health Ban, supported by the U.S. Office of Adolescent Health. The Successful Strategies for Improving Adolescent Health webinar series is sponsored by the HHS Office of Adolescent Health. This webinar is one of a series highlighting local, state, and national efforts to improve adolescent health and is part of a national call to action called Adolescent Health Think, Act, Grow, or TAG. My name is Emily Novick. As the team lead for communications at the Office of Adolescent Health, or OAH, I'm very pleased to be with you today to talk about TAG and to share information about a successful strategy to improve adolescent health. Our webinar today features the Teen Health Van. The Teen Health Van is a mobile clinic program that provides comprehensive primary health care services to homeless, uninsured, and underinsured youth in the Bay Area. For this webinar, we're joined by Dr. Seth Ammerman, a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Adolescent Medicine, Stanford University, and the founder and director of the Teen Health Van, which is sponsored by the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Before I turn it over to Dr. Ammerman, I'd like to share a little bit about OAH and TAG. The Office of Adolescent Health is located in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. OAH was first funded in 2010 and charged by Congress with developing a national plan for improving adolescent health. OAH has used its limited resources and the input of experts to synthesize what, about what works and spur action in support of adolescent health. The TAG call to action is a first response to that charge. With this webinar, we're pleased to share an example of a program that makes it easier for young people to gain access to health care. TAG identifies access to health care as one of the five essentials for healthy adolescents. Adolescent Health Think, Act, Grow, or TAG, builds on the collective work and insights of many professionals, researchers, and family members who know what it takes to promote the health and healthy development of America's 42 million adolescents. Teens are generally fairly healthy, yet there are many missed opportunities to promote adolescent health and to intervene promptly as challenging health issues emerge in adolescence and young adulthood. TAG is a comprehensive, strengths-based, positive youth development approach to adolescent health rather than a risk-based approach. TAG is designed to help young people reach their full potential as healthy, productive adults. With TAG, we hope to spur action across multiple groups of professionals and organizations and communities that all share a common interest in promoting adolescent health. Stakeholder engagement is a core tenet that drives all aspects of TAG and reflects our understanding that many determinants of adolescent health lie outside the healthcare system. The goals for TAG are the following. To raise awareness about the importance of adolescent health, engage stakeholders, youth serving organizations and caring adults both, get adolescent health on the national agenda, and spur action. Long term, TAG contributes to achieving the Healthy People 2020 objectives for adolescent health developed by HHS. More details about TAG and the five essentials for healthy adolescents can be found on the OAH website. Before we begin with Dr. Ammerman's presentation, we'd like to point out that the content and views in this next portion of the webcast do not necessarily represent the official policies of the Office of Adolescent Health or of HHS. I'm now pleased to turn things over to Dr. Ammerman to learn more about the Teen Health Fan Project and its mission to improve adolescent health. Dr. Ammerman? Hello, it's a pleasure to be giving this presentation. Pleasure. I will be talking about the Teen Health Fan Program, which is a community outreach mobile clinic program of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford, in partnership with the Children's Health Fund. The program provides comprehensive health care and a medical home model of care targeting at-risk, high-risk, uninsured, and or homeless adolescents ages 10 to 25 years of age. Service sites are from San Francisco to San Jose, California. All sites are visited on a regularly scheduled basis. 
Patients can, re can receive follow-up at any van site, and if needed, transportation and or hand-holding is provided. To give a little background about the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Stanford Children's and the Teen Health Fan Program, in 1979, the Division of Adolescent Medicine was established at Stanford. In the early 1990s, a community needs assessment by the United Way of Santa Clara County revealed that adolescents had the poorest health outcomes of any age group. This community needs assessment identified a number of barriers relating to this, including a lack of financial resources, lack of health insurance, lack of transportation, and the way adolescents think. A group of doctors lobbied the hospital to address this issue, and after persistent efforts, I would say we were kind of like gnats, the hospital agreed to raise funding to provide care to these underserved adolescents. Importantly, the Children's Health Fund of New York had launched the first solely pediatric mobile clinic. Realizing the importance of bringing care to adolescents, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital Stanford purchased an RV and retrofitted this as a mobile clinic. Back then, you could not buy mobile clinics. There would always be an RV that was retrofitted. The initial funding costs included the RV and the retrofit. Ongoing include gas, maintenance, and repairs of the vehicle, patient medications and supplies, and personnel. The Teen Health Fan Program joined Children's Health Fund's national network, and the Children's Health Fund now has mobile clinic programs in 17 states and Washington, D.C. From the outset, the Teen Health Fan was set up as a medical home model of care. The adolescents that we serve have multiple unmet health care needs, medical, mental health, psychosocial, and nutrition and fitness. The method is to provide comprehensive and continuous care from an interdisciplinary team, which includes a doctor, male, a nurse practitioner, female. And I set up the program like this from the beginning because often adolescents, when they first receive care, prefer a provider of one gender or another. We often work with kids who have been neglected or abused, and until they get to know you, and very typically it's a female preferring a female provider or a male preferring a male provider, usually after the course over time, they're, they're fine with, with, with uh, either male or female provider, but it's really nice to be able to give them that choice initially. Additionally, we have a licensed clinical social worker and a registered dietitian who is also a certified fitness instructor. At the time of service, we provide all medications and supplies. We don't write the prescriptions. Uh, it would be sort of silly because the adolescents we see, they don't have insurance, they don't have money, they don't have So for them to get medications or supplies elsewhere would be very difficult for them. We also give all needed immunizations. We draw labs, which go to the Stanford lab, and that's in-kind uh, service provided by Stanford. We also do point-of-care testing on the van which includes pregnancy testing, urine pregnancy testing, basic urinalyses, blood hemoglobin finger stick testing, and rapid oral HIV testing. And that's all, those are all very useful and frequently utilized tests on the van. 
We have, from the beginning, created a relatively seamless system for specialty care, specialty tests, so that if a patient needs a specialist, for example, let's say they need, came in with diabetes and need an endocrinologist, we are able to have them get care at the local county hospital if they provide the service or through Stanford Children's Hospital uh, or in San Francisco at UCSF. And same for any specialized tests that are needed. Very importantly, we partner with community organizations and agencies who also serve these adolescents. It's a very nice collaborative model of care. So the agency, they provide non-health care services, and I'll be getting more into that, and we provide health care. So the services we all provide are very complementary and important to patients. Before we started the program, we performed our own community needs assessment. And we gained perspectives from the various partner agencies who work with these youth, as well as parents, as well as juvenile hall uh, providers, police. In other words, all the different folks that the adolescents would come into contact with on a fairly regular basis. But most crucially, we talk to the adolescents themselves, and they gave us a lot of insight into really what kind of care would work for them. And without talking with the adolescents, our program would not have nearly been as successful as it is. So being collaborative with the patients themselves, with the adolescents themselves, was really important and continues to be on an ongoing basis. What works? What doesn't work? How can we better engage uh, the adolescent patients? And the best comes from the adolescents themselves. I will now be showing a short video about the Teen Health Band program so you can see it in action. I hope you enjoy this. Most of the kids that we see on the van have only had sporadic medical care, if any. We see a lot of obesity, which is most common in low-income populations. But we, on the other hand, we also see malnutrition from kids who don't eat every day because they don't have money, who are homeless. We focus on underserved, at-risk, high-risk youth, and uninsured, underinsured, and homeless youth. I never had a doctor before I met Dr. Emmerman. I didn't have any health insurance. My mom couldn't afford to pay for it because we're living like paycheck to paycheck. And then I heard about the program that they have here, so I was like, okay, that sounds like you know something that can help benefit me. I met most of the kids that we see have multiple unmet medical, mental health, psychosocial, nutrition, fitness needs. We take what I call a strength-based approach. So we try to focus on the kids' strengths, not their weaknesses. And it makes a huge difference. Hey. Good to see, to see you. you. <laughs> now, the thing I'm proudest about the program is that we have a return visit rate of about 70%, which is extraordinarily high. And it shows the kids are really engaging with the program. He could easily just be at a hospital treating people that could pay him money. He's out here. And he's helped me in countless times where, even throughout college when I stopped seeing the man where I would call him and I would ask for help and he would somehow, you know, he would get me the card, send it to me via mail or something, just so that I could get what I needed at the time. Have someone care about you that much, that genuinely, for like, for free, is kind of amazing. And that's the main reason I think this man has so much to offer for those kids at risk. It's called a medical home model of care. So we're a medical home for these kids. Here is the mobile clinic that we have from 
our new one from a couple of years ago. And you can see it has the, the logos of Stanford Children's Health and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the Children's Health Fund. You can see Samsung there uh, who helped uh, provide some of the funding for our mobile clinic. It was a combination of uh, Samsung and some generous individual philanthropic donors who helped pay for this new mobile clinic two years ago. And of course, the adolescent photos on the side, which make it very appealing to the, to the patients. This is the inside of one of the exam rooms in the new mobile clinic. This is Rosa Maldonado, our assistant clinic manager and uh, medical assistant. And you can see the exam table on the lower right, and it has stirrups for pelvic exams. We actually talked with the adolescents about the interior design because we wanted it to be teen-friendly and appealing, and they actually helped pick out the colors and the patterns there. You can see up to the right of Rose's head above there is a monitor, we're able to use mirroring technology uh, to engage the adolescents with, so they can see actually what we see when we're examining their eyes or skin and so on. They really enjoy that. We have a printer down in the far left, so we're able to print out uh, using Wi-Fi a variety of different patient-related handouts, and it's, it's Wi-Fi connected to the laptop you can see on the lower left corner. And all this modern technology is very engaging and helpful for the care we provide. Some of the success and important factors essential to the success in working with adolescents, we specifically utilize a strength-based approach. The, the adolescents we work with often have had difficult and chaotic lives, and sadly, most of them are used to hearing how they messed up or that they're losers. We don't do that. We explicitly focus on strengths rather than weaknesses. And at the initial visit, every single patient is asked what his or her strengths are. Now, they may not understand that term, some do, so they will understand what are your strengths. But in other ways we put it, or what are you best at, or what do you like most about yourself? And they have never heard this. They've only heard what problems they've had. And so this in and of itself is a really important engaging and bonding aspect of care. And as we continue to see them and get to know them better, we explicitly comment on their successes and achievements. And they may just be baby steps, but that's fine because strength builds strength and success builds success. In working with adolescents, we provide adolescent-friendly, respectful, and non-judgmental services. Unfortunately, a lot of the adolescents we work with have had the opposite experience where it hasn't, they've gone to get care and it hasn't been that friendly or respectful and it has been judgmental. And of course, they're not going to engage with that and they're not going to go back for care. We provide care that is socially and culturally appropriate. As one example, we have a large Latino population and most of us speak Spanish, and that is helpful. We maintain privacy and confidentiality and discuss confidentiality up front with all patients. We also provide in small incentives for patients to undergo a comprehensive history and physical or to complete their immunization series. And it's things like movie tickets or gift cards and these incentives are important because they can't afford these things. You know, nowadays for two people to go to a movies and buy popcorn and a drink, you're talking $30, $40, if not more. 
And it's such a team thing, an adolescent thing to do to go to the movies. So by using these small incentives really helps them engage again with the program. We also, with all of our sites, we have peer outreach and counseling. Adolescents respond particularly well to this. So most of the adolescent patients, when they come in for care, they realize that healthcare providers, the, the agenda really is just we want our patients to be healthy. We're not their parents who they may have issues with. We're not their teachers who are, of course, grading them. We're not their probation officer and so on. Our agenda is just for them to be healthy. They get that, and with that, they're more or less <laughs> willing to listen to us, I think more so over time as they get to know us. But the peer peer counseling really adds a whole other dimension and is very complementary to what we healthcare providers say. I wouldn't say it's better, uh, but nor would I say that what I say is necessarily better. So the peer counseling and the provider counseling really act in a very complementary Fashion, and I would add that all of our peer counselors have formal training in healthcare issues. So they're giving out accurate information, but they're also giving their perspective on it, which is really matters. We do ongoing youth outreach at all of our partner sites. So new youth who are involved in the sites know about the program, as well as new staff and other folks to help promote our program. And we promote each other's programs because we'll see kids who don't know about the community agency we're working with. They may just happen by, and we're able to promote their services, and all of our site partners promote our services as well. And very importantly, we have fun. We uh, will tell a joke on occasion. Uh, we'll we'll be, be light and Adolescents really appreciate that, even if there's serious issues involved. They enjoy having a little bit of fun, and we do too. And that makes it a more kind of relaxed environment, which they enjoy. How did we develop a successful program like this? There are really a number of important aspects to that. The first is to have a mission statement that is clear and straightforward. So we're part of Stanford University, Stanford Children's Hospital Healthcare, and Stanford has three missions. One is clinical care. Obviously, I would add high high quality <laughs> for all of the, all of these aspects, but certainly uh, high quality clinical care. The second is training the, the next generation of, of doctors and nurses and, and other healthcare providers. And the third is research. So from the beginning of me setting up this program, the missions of the Teen Health Fan Program met the missions of Stanford Children's Hospital. And that was very important because there were much more likely to be supportive of the program as we're meet, doing the same mission as the hospital. Performing a cost-benefit analysis and return on investment was important. And I do this annually, actually, where we look at what are our expenses, how much are we spending, and how much does this save on health care costs because of our focus on prevention and early intervention. And I use very common problems that we see with the kids we work with, and I'll just give one brief example right now. We were at a site where a kid just happened to come in uh, because she was late on her period. Uh, she wouldn't have gone uh, to the doctor for this particular, and also she was uninsured anyway. Um, but it turned out she was pregnant. We did a pregnancy test. We discussed options with her. She decided to continue the pregnancy. She was smoking uh, cigarettes regularly, 
had gotten no prenatal care. Uh, and we were able to get her into prenatal care. We were able to get her to stop smoking. And she ended up having a healthy baby. Now, had we not been there, she would have likely not had prenatal care until much later. She would have continued smoking. Let's take the best case scenario of she just had a small for gestational age baby, but it needed to be in the neonatal unit for a couple weeks because it was small for gestational age and probably a little premature even. Now that in and of itself, and we won't even talk about neonatal ICU, but that in and of itself would have cost close to $100,000 for all of that care for this preemie SGA baby. What we were able to provide her with was in the thousands of dollars. So that one example is a huge cost saving. And then others, common ones would be immunizations, making sure a patient doesn't is immunized against hepatitis A or B, even things like flu vaccines. So very common things that we see that we know by early diagnosis and treatment and support and help, we can really make a difference. And it saves money, significant amounts of money. Importantly, too, we develop realistic and relevant outcomes and track them regu regularly. So we track outcomes every six months. We utilize pre- and post-intervention in surveys. So examples are uh, short-term immunization. So if you need hepatitis B, getting those three hepatitis B immunizations, if you haven't had any, or catching up if you had one or two of the three, and uh, looking at that. More medium-term interventions, and these are based, again, on common issues that we see, which include risky sexual behavior or substance use. So we look at, are we reducing the frequency and or intensity of these risky behaviors? And we ask them explicitly about tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use or the risky sexually activity. And again, every six months we can look and see that hopefully um, most of the patients are being less risky and healthier. And then we also look at long-term outcomes. And in particular, these would involve mental health issues such as depression. Now, depression is not necessarily curable but it's certainly treatable, both through medication and or counseling, and we follow all that and look at outcomes, as well as, of course, how is the patient functioning? Are they now doing well in school because their depression is better when they were really struggling in school because of their depression is one example. So track, having relevant, realistic outcomes and tracking them regularly is very important. Over the years, we've learned some important lessons. First was finding natural allies and engaging them in our work. So it turns out that Stanford Children's Hospital has actually seven different hospital auxiliaries. And they raise money for hospital programs. And they have consistently provided both financial support, which is important, but also moral support. They literally let the hospital administration know how important this community outreach program is. Yes, the hospital does fantastic work inpatient and saves lives daily inpatient, but equally important is the work outpatient and ultimately helping the, these patients lead healthy, productive lives as adults. Additionally, child psychiatry provides free care for patients in return for bringing their trainees as part of the community psychiatry rotation. This is very important for more complicated mental health kids to have a child psychiatrist involved. So it's a win-win. Trainees get to be out in the community, and we get free health care for more complicated psychiatric patients. 
as I mentioned, we collaborate with a variety of different sites. And it's very important that a person be designated as the teen health band contact uh, person. So whoever this person is, I meet with them on a regular basis. Typically, it's every six months to discuss what is working well and what could be going better. And this includes designating the adolescent or peer, peer uh, health educators or other adolescent leaders and getting their input, too. And as you know, uh, sometimes community partner sites can change, the personnel can change, their outlook can change, and so on. So this is important that we're, we're keeping in touch formally, regularly. I work very closely with the development team of both Packard Children's Hospital Foundation and the Children's Health Fund for gift and grant funding. Since we essentially don't bill for any of our services for patients, we have to raise all the money, and that's done through gifts and grants. I work very closely with media relations at both my hospital and Children's Health Fund to be known in the community. And that really gets people interested. And the more the program is out there and people know that you're helping those who need help, the better. And I invite interested persons and potential donors and donors to see the program in action. It's one thing for me to talk about working with high-risk youth or uninsured or homeless youth, but on another level, when they come out to the mobile clinic and see the kids, and if they have kids and these kids look like their kids, and it's really eye-opening. Uh, and just to see the mobile clinic, uh, you saw the inside exam room, which is beautiful, of our new mobile clinic. I sometimes have donors come in and say, hey, this is nicer than my doctor's office, uh, which is great. They enjoy that that these kids are actually in a really nice environment, getting care in a, a nice environment. This is a website to find out more about the Teen Band Program. And you can feel free to contact me as well. My information is on the website. And I, again, want to thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ammerman, for sharing that overview of the teen van efforts to improve the health of adolescents. Uh, now we'd like to take a few minutes to ask some additional questions. First, why did your organization make a priority of adolescent health? That really came out of the United Way's community needs assessment that I mentioned. It was kind of a surprise to everyone that adolescents had the worst health outcomes. Now, part of it uh, is developmental. Adolescents are not adults. They're not miniature adults. They don't think like we do. <laughs> um, and they, uh, with our focus on prevention and early intervention, adolescents don't think like that. They go to the doctor when they need to or have to, but otherwise, typically, adolescent health care is very sporadic at best. And so by using a mobile clinic model and going to them, and a good example is the patient I talked about who, who just came in because she was late on her period, uh, that we can then get into all her other health care issues, but she would not have otherwise gone out that way. And so the hospital realized that we could really make a difference in improving adolescent health care with underserved kids in particular using a mobile clinic model. Next question is, can you tell us a little more about the interdisciplinary nature of the program? Yes, and that's important, so thank you for bringing that up. So, it, as I mentioned, our patients are complex patients. They have often multiple unmet health care needs, medical, 
mental health, psychosocial, nutrition, fitness. And one nice thing about having all these aspects of care provided by the Teen Health Fan Program is it gives patients multiple entrees into the system so that they may just come in for some common medical issue that an adolescent has, whether it's headaches or stomach aches or acne or menstrual problem. Uh, or they may want to be seen more for some mental health issue like depression or anxiety or ADHD. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or they may have psychosocial issues like family problems or school problems or relationship problems with their boyfriend or their girlfriend and are just things are not going well. Or they may be overweight and want help with their weight, or they may be malnourished because they're homeless and aren't eating every day. Uh, or they just may want some um, information about what's healthy uh, in terms of eating. And importantly, what we found is actually kids are very interested in the physical activity and fitness issues. So. Depending upon their main interests, they may have the uh, entree through the social worker if it's psychosocial mental health, and then she will talk with them, do a visit, and then say, hey, you know, uh, it seems like you may have some medical issues. Good to see the doctor or the nurse practitioner, or maybe nutrition, fitness, or they'll start with the RD, registered dietitian, and then she'll send them into the social worker or to see us medically, or they start with us medically, and then we will refer them into the social worker or the registered dietitian. So having that interdisciplinary team and allowing kids to access whatever they feel like is most important first really is helpful. We let them know from the outset, by the way, let's say they come in for a, med for a medical issue, even if they don't need or want to see the social worker or the dietitian that visit, we will still introduce everybody as the team. That way they know we all work together and that should something come up in the future or if in the future they do want to talk with another provider, it's there and that we work together. And we found that a very good strategy as well. But to be able to address all these issues over time is really important. And Back to the strength-based approach in one hand is we'll say, what do you want to work on? Let's, let's take one, one thing, because we don't want to overwhelm them. Uh, what's one thing you think you could do better with? And often, of course, adolescents will choose the easiest thing to do. And by the way, that's true of adults as well. Um, but that's fine, because if they try to improve something and actually it could be small, actually start eating a little better, doing a little physical activity, taking better care of themselves medically, taking their medication, whatever it would be. We, when they come back and we note, note that, we can then again say to them, well, that's great, you're really doing better. You know, you have it, you can do it. This is a cool thing you're doing, taking better care of your health. And they really appreciate that, engage with that. And then they'll do the next step and ultimately more and more and be successful in that strength-based approach. What was already in place that helped you accomplish your work? And also, what is essential to success for this program and what does success look like? The already in place were really First of all, the pediatric mobile clinic that was started in New York by my friend and colleague Alan Shapiro through the Children's Health Fund. And that, that the success of that program really, I think, helped start the, the realization that going to patients, it's not just a matter of convenience, but developmentally, and all the barriers to healthcare that may exist, particularly transportation being a real healthcare barrier, uh, that it really made sense to utilize a mobile clinic model. Um, 
I'm sorry, could you repeat the other part of the question? What does success, um, what's essential to success, and what does success look like to you? So essential to success is that the adolescents are engaging and bonding with the program. We have a 70% return visit rate, which is extraordinarily high for an adolescent-focused program. And that's the thing I'm proudest about the program because it means they really have engaged and are willing to come back. And those 70% who come back really typically have the multiple unmet health care needs. And the fact they come back on a regular basis. And I would add that kids are in our program an average of about two and a half years. And also tracking the health care outcomes to really demonstrate that we really are improving their health. I think those are the main factors to let you know you're being successful. Can you share with us what are your top three lessons learned from working in this program? Yes. Number one is being very collaborative with patients, talking with them regularly, meeting with them, really hearing their points of view about what's helpful, what's not, how can things be improved, what do they like, what they don't, really matters. A lot of people write off adolescents. You know, of course, they would talk with their parents and other folks, but you got to talk with the adolescents themselves. Um, and that, that has really been um, an important factor. And I would mention one other thing that, that we are currently involved in. We got a grant to do a texting health intervention because, of course, all adolescents pretty much do these days is text. <laughs> and even our homeless adolescents, almost all of them have smartphones. Uh, and we, in collaboration with them, developed this texting health intervention, and they could choose a couple of topics they wanted to learn more about and improve their health about of, a, of, a, of 15 different common topics that we see with patients. And one very cool thing in, in collaborating with them, we were just going to send out the, t the health information via text, just so they would learn, and they said, hey, now, you know what, we really like interactive uh, texting, and why don't you make it into a quiz format? And then you can send out a quiz, send out quiz questions, and then we'll answer them. And I hadn't thought of that, none of we adults had. And so we re revised the information to send it out in a quiz format, and it's been a very successful program. Um, and they really like getting this information in it texting quiz format. So that's, uh, again, collaborating with our adolescent patients has been very important. I would also add a second thing related would be the peer health education and outreach. That's important to adolescents to have those peer connections of, of, of someone who they feel they can relate to, but who also is knowledgeable and can give them kind of no-nonsense advice and talk about how they approach similar issues. So that's also uh, an important factor. And then really the collaboration with community agencies. When I was first starting up the program, I thought I might just go to where homeless kids hang out and we'd park the mobile clinic and they'd come in. but. Someone pointed out to me that, you know, they don't know who you are, and even if you're Stanford, or, and they have a lot of trust issues, and they're really not going to come. But if you partner with agencies that are already working with them, who they already know and trust, and who can promote your program, that will really make a difference. And it has. And that's been a, that collaborative model has been very important to 
What is your advice to others who would like to do something similar to what you've done? I think that the couple, a few important things are to get the buy-in, so to speak, from your, your home institution. So if you're working through a hospital or some, some kind of healthcare setting, to get that, that kind of buy-in, which means, again, you're going to need to, as much as possible, have the same missions, mission or missions. Uh, again, in our case, it was clinical care, training, and research, all of which are, are I think, important. But different institutions will have somewhat different missions, which is fine. Doing the cost-benefit analysis, because it's, it's very hard to start up a new program without showing there's going to be at least some neutral costs uh, there or some even benefit. Now, I would add with that, our hospital, um, we're saving $10 for every dollar we spend, but it's not going to my children's hospital or the children's health fund. Um, it's, it's, it's going to the healthcare system. Uh, we're, we're ultimately long-term saving money by preventing chronic illness or other serious healthcare problems. But my children's hospital and the children's health fund gets it. It's doing the right thing, and it saves money in the healthcare system. Uh, but that cost-benefit analysis or return on investment is very important. And then, again, finding natural allies within your system who will, who will support the program. And, of course, making an adolescent focused, friendly, non-judgmental is, is really important so that adolescents will want to engage with the program. Last question, how can the Office of Adolescent Health help to inspire more state and local leadership on adolescent health issues? Another great question, and as you mentioned at the beginning, there are 42 million <laughs> approximately adolescents in this country, and I think that by providing more both webinars like this about adolescent health also in-person trainings, and one thing that I've seen to experience is that a lot of services for adolescents tend to be siloed. In other words, you've got maybe behavioral health folks doing some, you know, providing services, but they're just doing behavioral health, and then you've got your medical folks just doing the medical part of it, and you're, if, if they need nutrition, that's a separate thing. And I think one of the real important facets is promoting this inter interdisciplinary care model where you're really looking, taking into account the whole person uh, and providing services based on that whole person's needs. I think that really will make the difference. And so in terms of going to uh, whether it's, um, you know, state departments of health or county departments of health, I think all of that would be very important in promoting this kind of program. And I appreciate what you all are doing. It's great. really matters and makes a difference. On behalf of the Office of Adolescent Health, I want to thank you for joining us to learn about OAH and TAG and to hear about the wonderful work going on in the San Francisco Bay Area. Special thanks to Dr. Seth Ammerman for sharing this program with us. The TAG effort continues, and we invite you to get involved and spread the word about TAG within your professional networks. Here are a few of the things that you can do. You can explore our website, read and share the TAG playbook. Join TAG on our website and get email updates. 
Watch and share the Tag Talk videos with your colleagues. Notify your colleagues and grantees about Tag. Encourage your organization to use Tag action steps and resources. And use the Tag social media tools. Again, here are some of the ways you can connect with OAH and with Tag. You can go to our website to download free materials, sign up for e-updates, send your ideas and questions to tagteam at hhs.gov, and follow OAH on Twitter at teenhealthgov using hashtag tag42mil. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share TAG and a great example of TAG in action with you today.